Good morning, everyone. Um, brand commerce. I think my first question is going to be to you, Stephen. What the hell is brand commerce, and how does it differ from <laughs> e-commerce? <laughs> well, uh, the way we define brand commerce, we believe any true branded rich experience should be <coughs> only one step away from any commercial interactions. And it should, well, regardless of channels, could be physical, digital, any, any consumer touch points. That's how we define brand commerce. And I guess maybe I can jump in there from the brand perspective. Um, the way that I think uh, any large consumer brands, luxury brands, would think about this is that e-commerce is really about product availability, um, which for anyone who's either bought a luxury item or works for a luxury brand knows that it's actually the antithesis of luxury because it's all about unavailability. And brand commerce is really the flip side of that. It's really about brand desirability. And so I think um, what the future of, of you know, really commerce is all about is about making sure that as your product becomes more available online, you are also spending equal efforts in building desirability at the same time. Gotcha. Okay, so you guys have worked really well as a team, obviously, to put together a brand commerce solution for Clarence, I support as an uh, agency, e-commerce on the, the technical side, and obviously, Han, you're representing the brand. Can you, can you illustrate to everyone here just actually what that looks like? What are we talking about? What did you do for Clarence? Um, well, I mean, I think it was, uh, you know, really a lot of it is in small incremental steps, you know, so I've been with the company for six years and we've, you know, made a lot of strides um, during that time. But I think, you know, Ecamera as the main technical partner with us has been the one to help us to really understand the space, first of all, and understand the challenges. We also operate in, um, you know, globally. So I um, in multiple in APAC, EMEA and, and, and uh, America's in each one of those regions presents its own set of challenges. So I think having one um, uh, technology partner such as Ecamera um, to being able to have a really global view and to understand how we can allocate our resources in the uh, most efficient way has been um, you know, one of the reasons why we were able to be very successful and quickly and, and maybe Mark you can also comment on that since you are kind of the in the forefront of this as well. Sure. So Technically, um, the challenge is really being able to practice an agile commerce model because in this market, requirements change on a frequent basis, priorities change, and you really want a very well-designed system that you can roll out international sites very rapidly and you can change priorities. So we've created a model that can roll out multi-brand, um, multi-region uh, in a rapid time scale, but also be able to adapt uh, the workflow relating to priorities in each of those regions. And many of the regions have different requirements. You have different payment providers in specific markets, for example, China. Uh, you have different affiliate products. Um, in China, the sort of affiliate products, social media is really a commerce uh, engine in itself uh, in terms of that. And then finally, you get to the, the consumer themselves. So it's simplifying um, typically the browser site and the mobile site into a single entity because the growth of mobile has been extraordinary and businesses find themselves pulled in two different directions having to manage and maintain a mobile site uh, as well as a browser site. So consolidating them not only gives you a better user experience but helps the business focus on a single platform. Gotcha. And just so we're clear, because I think we're talking abstractions just a little bit so far, what we're talking about, as far as I understand it, it's kind of you know brand marketing, content marketing, and, and direct selling on your own platforms. Is that correct? Yeah, and I think you know it's um, it's different. It's difficult, and I think it's really a new way of looking at things to um, really see this as one holistic um, task. That in any organization, typically is usually divided into different groups and d different geos, and I think that has been um, in, in a way preventing um, you know. For, for brands especially to, to kind of miss the forest for the trees, you know, so to speak. So, we, you know, if you, if you think of, uh, of it as content, sales, and technology individually, I think you're missing the larger point of what is the consumer expecting when they're interacting with your brand in these different spaces, whether it's retail, whether it's online, whether it's on mobile. And I think it's really putting the consumer first. So instead of thinking about, okay, who's going to be producing what for the consumer, it's really the question is, what does the consumer want and how do we deliver it to them in the most efficient way possible? Gotcha. And you talked about, from, from your perspective as an organization, how, how things might need to change. I'm wondering if there are any 
uh, kind of blockers you came across yourself internally, um, whether it's cultural, structural, uh, working practices, skill sets, or how you uh, commonly collate and interact with the data that you get about your consumers? Were there hurdles that you had to jump over that you were expecting that were bigger than you thought, or, or did hurdles come out of nowhere that you didn't expect to have at all to have to deal with? Yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, so that's a very complex question, but I think, you know, to the, the heart of it about, about you know, what are the, the key challenges um, from the brand side, from an organization perspective, and it really comes down to organization, because I think for, um, you know, I've, I've always worked in, in luxury and beauty, and, and, and I've worked for some very, very fantastic brands, you know, that were started in the 19th century, and one of the, the, the pitfalls of, you know, working in a legacy brand is that the brands are very, very good at protecting um, history, protecting their legacy, their DNA, the way that things used to be done is really held in very high regard, right, because that's what you're selling. Um, and so what you run up against is, is really this new wave of innovation and potentially small mob and pop guys that are able to come in with a very agile product and a very agile process that's able to disrupt you in the market that you, that you operate in. So it's really being able to marry those two constraints. <clears throat> and one of the most difficult things is to convince your internal stakeholders to, be, to take a leap of faith to say, okay, well, that was the way we did it last year, but it's really not good enough for today's world and how to change those things and one of the things that um, you know I, I think is one of the, the best quotes that I ever heard um, I think it's from a guy um, at Yahoo who said that the way that any organization treats innovation is the same way that your body treats um, a bacteria or a virus so it tends to go after it and kill it and that's probably the most difficult part about working with this new way with brand commerce and with technology and with these guys is to make sure that you have all of the alignment of internal interest and buying in before you make huge investments and jump in. Running with the sickness analogy then, <laughs> Stephen, from your perspective uh, and, and an agency, do you find that sometimes if you're pitching ideas like this to clients, they, their reaction is what you'd expect when you approach them with a hypodermic needle saying, I'm going to give you something that's <laughs> going to make you very sick? Or, or are people beginning to uh, embrace um, this type of... Uh, interesting blend of selling and marketing. Yeah, actually we are seeing more and more people are willing to uh, you know, take on some new ideas and quickly launch a market. Like for, for instance, in, in US we had a, uh, a client from you know, travel hospitality. As you can imagine, right, they came to ISOVA saying, hey, you know, I only have a few million dollars to spend. I need to compete with Airbnb. Can you do something, create a new brand, new product, launch in six months? By the way, I, I want the campaign done as well. So, so people with, with the, all the disruption out there, I know that it's an overused term, but the acceleration of new business model and technology coming together, I don't believe you can ignore that aspect. So being innovative and also, I, I believe they should think more like a startup, you know, internally. Mark, is there a, a particular type of brand or business that's a good fit for brand commerce? Or the corollary of that is, is there a particular type of business that you know, this isn't going to work for? Um, so for industry, in, in, like I'm, I'm from a newspaper business, what can you do for me? Can you, is brand commerce going to help out in terms of circulation or visitors to the website? Certainly. To put it in perspective, you know, many of the manufacturer brands uh, like Clarins, uh, clothing brands, um, you know, other um, let's say, pure play brands, have managed to engage directly um, through a, a form of e-commerce model. And what that meant is they've got a lot more direct consumer information that they can work from, and it's helped drive changes to packaging, product design, all of these elements. And it's been a very enriching experience as well as a, a revenue experience. And they've had to deal with sort of channel conflict and all of the elements that Han mentioned in terms of innovation. They... The next wave, I think, in this environment will be for CPG companies and FMCG companies because really they want to, you know, enhance that digital opportunity for their business. And many of these brands are not particularly suited to any form of direct digital commerce. Um, so if you think of categorizing the products of the brands, there's some brands that consumers will buy individually uh, in terms of that. And there's some brands that really you want to put into a shopping basket and you'll go through Tesco's or uh, Asda, whoever it is you shopping with. So it's really important to understand that matrix in terms of that. And I think for 
uh, brands in terms of brand commerce that are coming from that environment, it's not really about the direct-to-consumer e-commerce model. It's about leveraging that digital ecosystem. So Amazon are moving into this market. They're creating Amazon Fresh, um, Amazon Pantry. And if you think about Amazon's model of customer service, this is a direct threat to the retailers themselves. So it's going to raise the game on the retail side, but it'll create a new digital channel to market. In markets like China, uh, Tmall, Taobao, Alibaba are all very established channels to market in terms of that. And then you've got all of the social commerce, you've got the um, collaboration between Twitter and Amazon. There are many more digital channels that you can, you can take to market. So we come back to what Stephen had said earlier and Han had said, it's about making the brand and the product very compelling. So having a message to the consumer from a creative standpoint to bring them to the brand side and then leveraging every appropriate digital channel for your business. So I don't see any market that can exclude themselves from this, but I don't think there's a standard recipe you would just stamp on it. Yeah, okay. From, from what we've discussed so far, <clears throat> if I was sitting out in the crowd, I'd go, okay, this is something that's applicable or best applicable to, to bigger businesses, to bigger brands. Is that the case, that the, the bigger the brand, the bigger the opportunity to do this, or is is scale not really that big an issue if you're doing it right? Maybe this is one for you, Stephen. No, no, I, I, I don't believe uh, that's really the case. And it's, it's, if you think about the maturity and the acceleration of all the digital ecosystem out there and, and basically completely level the playing field for any brand to compete, doesn't matter if you're the biggest or the smallest, and it's the, I, we believe it's the ability how quickly you can introduce new product and services to the market and quickly adjust it, right? Get all the data, and now you have all the data you want and keep refining it. So I, I think it's, it doesn't really matter how big you are or small you are. So again, the same point really to you, Han. If, if, um, if you were advising someone who was doing a mom and pop type startup and they were looking at the likes of Etsy, w would you be saying, uh, you, you can do this yourself, you can own it yourself, or, or would you actually be saying, actually Etsy is a way of doing your own uh, brand marketing? Yeah, I think it's both, but I mean, it's, it's really not the size of the business, I think it's the size of the opportunity. So I think if you're a smaller brand, you have the same, the same opportunity. So in fact, there's actually more to be gained here if you're a smaller, if you're a startup, if you're trying to build your brand. And I think, you know, to Stephen's point, it really is a leveling uh, level playing field. It's no longer the case that if you want to um, compete with the big guys, you have to, you know, put the same amount of money on the table to be able to get the same share of voice from media, the same, um, the same type of features that you can offer your consumers. I think it's really something where that um, if there's something that you want to do, if there's a service you would like to provide to your customers, there's probably a startup out there that's already doing that. That will take a percentage of your revenue and be able to launch something for you in a very, very quick time scale. And that's something that bigger brands actually need to be aware of as uh, something that could be a major challenge to the way that they're doing business. It used to be, uh, you know, if, if, for example, in, uh, in the luxury beauty market, you would have the top five guys, the top five players, probably owning about 70, 80% of, um, of the market space, right? And if you break down these top five, it's actually two companies that actually own these brands. So there's a lot, there was a lot of, um, you felt a lot of insulation to say, you know what, if these guys, if, the, if my four competitors are not doing it, I don't really need to worry about it. But it's really not the case anymore because you have these small brands who could do something that is totally disruptive, right? So in the example that Stephen gave of, you know, a major hotel chain saying that now Airbnb is my challenger, the same thing exists in all of the other verticals. And I think it's really more of a uh, wake-up call for larger brands to say, you know, this is really what's coming in the future if you don't pay attention. Gotcha. And where does this strategy fit into to Clarence overall? Is this the beginning of a move away from bricks and mortar or is it something that's going to augment the kind of physical reality of needing to have a a shop store presence. Yeah, I think you know this is something that Mark and I have discussed a lot about, and it's it's we both are in agreement that it's really not moving away from any per one particular channel, right? It's not that e-commerce is going to kill retail, retail is going to kill e-commerce. I think it's really more of an expansion of different consumer touch points, and you have to see it in this way, right? So if you if you say, well, I'm just going to take the resources that I would have put into media or I would have put into stores, and I'm going to put it on digital, you're actually not going to win because your 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 customers are everywhere. The the expectation has changed. So when they go 
to a store, they don't expect to be serviced in the same way, or maybe they don't even expect to make a purchase. And if you don't realize that and able to deliver on what their new expectation is, that's <clears> where I think the loss can come from. But it's, it's really about recognizing the channel for what it is, and it's really different for different products, right? And make sure that you're giving your consumer that. I don't know if you wanted to add to that. I think it's really about enhancing all channels. Typically, I think most companies have been overawed with the growth rate uh, of the e-commerce channel, and mainly because it's new. You can get to new markets quite quickly. You don't have the same level of infrastructure. So it's been far more dramatic in terms of the growth. But fundamentally, you need a balance between both businesses. And if you look at the omni-channel uh, experience that most companies talk about, it's about you know, having an online consumer channel that brings people to the store. Click and Collect has been very positive. From a retail perspective, they're able to upsell customers. Customer service will differentiate. You know, we find customers that really focus, sorry, retailers that really focus on customer service and customer success have the highest growth rates. So fundamentally, if there's a return from a digital channel, they bring it into store, it can be upsold, it can be changed, and it's that whole sort of augmented and consolidated customer experience that makes the difference. And I think you'll find all channels will grow respectively in terms of that. It strikes me from what we're talking about that one of the real opportunities in this is actually for brands to have a very unmediated relationship with their consumers, to own the data, not to be reliant on retailers, say, to be relaying back third, kind of, you know, secondhand, here, here's what we think people are doing, how they're interacting with your stuff. So I'm wondering, is part of this strategy developing a single view of the customer, a way that you can actually track your customers, whether it's an omni-channel, and we talked about different regions, so being able to say, you know, we, we can see this person has these various different touch points and they buy at certain times, but they check in with us at certain times. Is this, is this something that's achievable or is it kind of the holy grail that's out there somewhere? I mean, it is the holy grail, and I think a lot of companies, uh, medium and large companies, are putting a lot of money on the table to achieve this, right? The single view of customer. doesn't matter if you're sh shopping in uh, Shanghai or if you're buying in a travel retail in Miami or my store. I can see who you are. I can see what you've done. Um, so it is, it's something that's quite expensive to achieve if you are uh, a brand that is operating in multi-locales. Um, but it's something, it's doable. But in the meantime, you know, you don't need to wait for that, uh, that to happen. You do have consumer data, and it's about what you make use of it, right? And uh, so if you have a website, then you already know who your customers are in a way, or one single version of that. And to be able to kind of um, dig deep and, and figure out what it is that your customer is doing or telling you through that data, I think is the first step. And then, Stephen, over to you. On, on the agency side, I'm wondering if the rise of brand commerce is going to change the way agencies need to behave to kind of reach out to customers and create these kind of um, seamless solutions that are, are helping businesses do what they need to do best. Are, are you, seeing, are you uh, finding that people are asking you for a different type of things or you need to act slightly differently as an agency? Yeah, well, I have a client here, so she can <laughs> tell me. Yes. Be careful what no, you say. No doubt, no doubt. I think the expectation is, remember I talk about the compression of time and money and then you need to quickly react to the market and launch any new product and services meaning you have to have integrated discipline, right? You have to put strategy, creativity, technology, and also storytelling all together. So I, I can imagine, uh, at least I can speak for our agency, we are definitely seeing the shift, and uh, you need to drive more value uh, out of in, in a more uh, shorter time frame and limited budget. And then a last point, because we're running out of time. It strikes me that brand commerce is an absolutely horrible phrase that fell out of a PowerPoint presentation somewhere. <laughs> and I'm wondering, as the creative agency guy on the panel, is there a better name for this that can actually promise to consumers what we're talking about, which is a kind of, you know, we'll give you what you want when you want it. Well, I, I think we could have called it so many different way. And the reason we chose brand commerce, we don't want to neglect the power of brand, as Han uh, described earlier. When, 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 we, when we're all competing with the same ecosystem, let's say everything, everything in the cloud, well, what are the most important things you're competing in the market, right? Will be your brand storytelling, how you communicate the emotional connection uh, between the brand and consumer. And then it's how you elevate your customer services, right, in, in, in the world we're living in. And last but not least will be how you create loyalty. So instead of can it calling anything connected commerce, anywhere commerce, I think brand commerce is the most appropriate. Does the job. Excellent. Thank Guys, thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you.